Greetings, Internet. It's your soul, and I'm just going to draw your attention here to a very important document that's just been released, which is a draft version of a report from the University of Alaska Fairbanks via PhD Dr. J. Leroy Halsey. And he, along with a couple of other PhD uh, researchers, have worked for four years on a study of the collapse of World Trade Center Building 7 at the time of the 9-11 events in New York back in 2001. And this is a huge, huge subject, but the very short version of this is that the government at the time put, put out a, a report called the NIST report, uh, whereby they analysed the events at that time of the various different tower collapses, and they concluded that there's nothing to see here, move along, basically the towers just collapsed because of predictable things, the planes flew into them, they exploded, it caused the collapse, fires basically raised the temperature, melted steel, or either melted or softened steel enough that the towers collapsed. And even though World Trade Center 7 wasn't even hit by any planes, uh, it still somehow managed to collapse into its own footprint perfectly at almost three full speeds. What can you say about that? I mean, is it really likely that a building not hit by anything other than a small amount of debris from a building nearby, with only a few internal office fires on a couple of different floors, would just suddenly, out of nowhere, completely collapse inward and downwards in perfect symmetry of its own footprint, not damaging any other structures really as it fell uh, at near free full speeds. And for those of you who have been following this since 2001, you may have uh, seen the various different investigations done into this and comments by various different professionals, including demolitions experts, structural engineers, architects, and so on. You've got architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth who basically, as I understand, funded or helped organize and fund this study Basically, they got over 2,000 professional structural engineers and architects to sign a statement basically saying that there's no way that the official government version of what happened to these towers is, is possible. They can't be correct, and they stake their reputation on that. So, obviously, this is a very important event, an issue, and if it's proven that, first of all, the government's reports were inaccurate, that's very important. We need to look into that. It's basically a massive crime and their research and study of this was not accurate, which means that their conclusions weren't accurate, which means that in the case of these towers coming down, there's every possibility that more went on than simply planes hitting two towers, somehow causing a chain of events that caused all three to collapse. And it is entirely possible, in fact, that there was an inside job and explosives perhaps were planted inside these buildings in advance to bring them down based on a very highly organized military type attack possibly unlikely organized by elements of the US government themselves for their own reasons. And many people have made very long documentaries and lots of research into that subject. I'm not going to dive into all that background here. It's just too much information. I would suggest looking at, for example, James Corbett's work on this. He's put out several very good videos from 9-11, The Trillions, where he looks into the money, follow the money, I think it's called, The Missing Trillions, uh, and there's other ones as well. There's lots of them. But what I'm going to take you through here is a brief look through what's in this document, because it's literally just been released in the last couple of days after four years of work. And as far as I know, this is by far the most in-depth and comprehensive academic study of these events um, that's been done. And the short version is they disagree completely with the American government's NIST report. They say basically the data in there was wrong, uh, the calculations were wrong, and the conclusions were wrong and they demonstrate how and why that is using uh, state-of-the-art technology, calculation software, and a huge amount of time uh, and focus from experts in the field. So this document, as you can see, it's fairly comprehensive. Uh, I am should preface this with I'm not a qualified structural engineer or architect. As it happens, my mom now passed on, deceased, was actually a, a structural engineer. So I do know a bit more about it than the average person, but I'm definitely not an expert in it, and I'm definitely not qualified to say definitively whether the contents of this report are accurate or not. And ultimately, a lot of what they're talking about in here is based on uh, models that they've created in software to assess the outcome of certain events, of, of different uh, structural events happening within these towers. And, you know, even if I was an expert in it, without seeing their software and their 
the actual models, I probably wouldn't necessarily be able to say a whole lot about it accurately anyway. But at the end of the day, they have scientifically gone through this process. They've looked at NIST's uh, methodologies and they've compared NIST's results to their own and they have produced their own results with very, very detailed explanations as to the differences between their approach and NIST's approach. They tried to recreate NIST's approach. They found that NIST's approach was flawed. And eventually they produced a method of analysis and an explanation, a hypothesis for the collapse of, of Building 7 that actually matches exactly what happened, which you can see in the videos, which NIST reports never did. They actually, in their simulated models, showed the tower buckling and twisting, which didn't even happen. So the idea that, I mean, it doesn't really, you don't even really need to do a huge amount of research to realise that NIST's calculations weren't right because their own models show the building collapsing in a way that it didn't actually collapse. So, yeah, but... Just going to quickly show you some video clips here as well before we go into the more detail of that report because there are lots of very relevant videos to this subject and I'm just going to show you here, this is a short one uh, by the chairman and another member of the 9-11 commission who was set up to produce the NIST report as I understand it, uh, where they effectively say that they were quote set up to fail and they didn't have enough funding or time to actually do the work properly. We had so there are all kinds of reasons we thought we were set up to fail. We got started late. We had a very short time frame. Indeed, we had to get it extended. Uh, we did not have enough money. They were, they were afraid we were going to hang somebody, that we would point the finger. Lee and I write in our book that um, we think the commission in many ways was set up to fail because we had um, not enough money. We didn't have enough time. We've been appointed by the most partisan people in Washington. Right, so <laughs> it's pretty damning there, isn't it? I mean, even the people that wrote the NIST report basically say, or the 9-11 Commission reports say that they think they were politically set up to fail. Now that's, you know, I would say that's quite a concern, to me at least. So here's another interesting video, which is by uh, featuring... Um, one of the scientists involved in that whole government analysis and, you know, <laughs> body language says a lot. So let's check out his body language and see what he has to say and the points made in this video. I'm curious about uh, the, uh, the pool of molten steel that was found in the bottom of the, of the towers. Um, I, I am too. And it, <laughs> please tell me about it. Have you, have you seen it? Well, I, not personally, but eyewitnesses there found huge poles of molten steel beneath the towers and uh, scientists, some scientists don't think that the uh, collapse of the building could have melt, melted all that steel and uh, uh, professor, physics professor analyzed some of the steel and uh, Stephen Jones and he found evidence of, uh, of thermate residue mm -hmm. which would explain how the buildings collapsed. So just to point out that thermate and thermite are chemicals used in compounds used in demolition basically to break apart steel and he's saying that they found residue of those materials in the steel samples taken from the tower uh, site at 9-11 and that's a controversial subject but that's just what he's talking about just to highlight that pre-planted explosives so have you analyzed the uh, the steel for uh, any of those residues um First of all, let's go back to your basic uh, premise that there was uh, a pool of molten, molten steel. Um, I know of absolutely nobody, and no eyewitness who said so. You'd get down below and you'd see molten steel, oh. molten steel running down the channel rails, like you're in a foundry. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like lava. Like, like, like lava. The fires got very intense down there and actually melted beams where it was molten steel that was being dug out. It's this fused element of, of steel, mo molten steel and concrete and all of these things all fused by the heat into one single element. And almost like a chunk of lava from Kilauea or Iceland where they're very sharp but, but breakable shards on the end here. This eight ton steel I-beam is six inches thick. So there's quite a few different scenes in here, but I'm just going to take you through a couple of relevant ones. There's lots of different witnesses basically saying molten steel, molten steel, molten steel. Um, 
I'll put the link to this in the video beneath if you want to watch it all. But let's just, now that we've heard some of the testimonies and there are many more of there being molten steel, let's just see how he finishes off here. First couple of weeks at least. Go back to your basic uh, premise that there was uh, a pool of molten, molten steel. Um, I know of absolutely nobody, and there's no eyewitness who said so, nobody who's produced it. Uh, I was on the site, I was on the steel yards. So I can't, I don't know that that's so. There's uh, a video so of it. It's around 2,600 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Um, I think it's probably pretty difficult to get that kind of uh, uh, temperatures in a, um, uh, in a fire. So I, I don't know the basis. I, I can't uh, you know, address your question if I, if I don't know the basis. Well, NASA pictures, uh, thermal uh, images showed those, those sorts of temperatures in the basement. Would you send them to me? Okay. My name is Mark, and I'm the individual who was questioning Dr. Gross, and he asked me, to email to him those thermal images. When I approached him after his talk to get his email address for that purpose, he refused to provide it to me. I think this is important because it reveals the attitude of the NIST investigators, which is one of willful ignorance of what really happened on 9-11. So there we go, pretty damning, I would say. And I mean, you know, body language says a lot. This guy, uh, Mr. Gross, good name, uh, really does look gross and shifty as heck, you know, I mean, I wouldn't, I personally wouldn't buy a used car from him, that's all I'm saying. Um, and then we also have a video here, which I'm not going to show you all of, but basically it's a, a firefighter here going through explaining how uh, there are certain protocols that are meant to be followed when for, uh, investigations into collapses and, and fires take, take place, such as should have taken place with 9-11 in the towers and so on. Uh, and he goes through the, the sort of standard report for doing that and basically shows you point by point how it just wasn't followed. And people may remember that massive amounts of material were taken away from the site immediately, very, very quickly, shipped off and disposed of, which is basically getting rid of uh, huge amounts of evidence from a crime scene without properly investigating it. That's literally what happened. Ridiculous number of trucks used to remove all of that. How they organise it so quickly, I mean, again, that's something that needs to be looked into. So that's just some of the background. I could go on and on and on, but when we look more deeply into this document, it talks about how there was a report produced by NIST and also reports produced by two um, structural engineering companies, one of whom actually was one of the ones my mum used to work for, uh, Ave Arup. So, and, and they were produced in for reference with the insurance court case that followed where the insurance company, one of the insurance companies was attempting to get out of paying any insurance payment basically by saying that it was a fault in the design of the building and not uh, anything that was covered by the insurance policy. So you had two, two different engineering companies essentially contracted to kind of produce an explanation as to how World Trade Center 7 collapsed, one in support of the idea that it was as a result of the events of 9-11 and one in opposition to that. So the researchers from Alaska basically looked at all of these reports and tried to reproduce uh, some of the findings, ran tests, ran models, looked at the maths of it all. And the short version of all of this is that basically they found that there were errors in all of the reports and so in some cases... Uh, maths were uh, errors have been made with the maths to do with uh, certain parameters of the structure of the building, flexibility of the outer walls, that kind of thing. They've made assumptions which were wrong. Um, the NIST report really came out worse in the sense that somewhere in here, which I'm probably not going to find now, I literally just finished reading all of this. It's not that long to read. Um, so about two thirds of the way through, it lists off a whole bunch of assumptions that they'd made which just weren't right to do with the actual construction of the building. For example, concluding that some of the um, girders had components missing from them, which they didn't. And and in some cases, they'd completely missed out some of the actual beams that were present in their calculation. Uh, so they really just fluffed the calculations in a very unprofessional way, which produced the wrong results, which you could see in their simulation, which I think we can see pictures of. So they explain how essentially the calculations from NIST uh, featured a particular set of a particular area of the of the construction of the columns saying that particular ones failed and in a certain way that caused the building to collapse and they demonstrate how if if what they said had happened had actually happened then we wouldn't have got the results that we saw 
and then they went on to test and check which floors actually would have needed to um, have damage done to them and where in order to see the results that we actually see. And each of these drawings represents a different version of their model. Um, and they're comparing that to the actual video footage. And this version, or these two versions, I think that's the last one, is closest to what we actually see in the video, which is that part of the penthouse collapses and warps because of a failure in um, these, this column area here, about two thirds of the way up, which was above where the fires were. So they're basically saying the only way that we could reproduce what we see in the videos in our models uh, of this building collapsing was if one of the core failure points happened quite high up um, and that was above where the fires were actually taking place. So therefore, fires could not possibly have caused the collapse of this building. That's their sort of summation. Um, they don't talk about the potential for explosives and that kind of thing. That's beyond their remit. They're not chemical, chemically analyzing the remnants, and looking for thermite, that kind of thing. Their role is just to look at the structure and to find out whether um, the NIST report and other reports are accurate and what really happened. So they're showing here essentially that if uh, the other reports were accurate, then the Tower World Trade Center 7 would have fallen over in a particular direction due to the difference in the number of columns on one side to the other. It wouldn't have fallen straight down. Uh, and the only way that they could actually get it to fall straight down in the way that it actually did in real life at near free fall velocity was by putting in a model whereby both the inner and the outer columns all uh, failed on a certain level at the same time within one second of each other. Uh, and by doing that, you get this situation, as you can see here, where the penthouse buckles here, they recreated that accurately, uh, and then the whole thing just comes down, straight down, pretty much. So this is a list of all the actual floors and what was on them. And you can see we've got US Secret Service had two floors. Um, you've got various different banks and the Securities and Exchange Commission. Now there's a whole, whole long trail of evidence connected to that and what they were investigating, missing trillions from the Pentagon budget and various other big, large scale, massive crimes and frauds and black budget, you name it, basically government crime. Uh, apparently they were actually investigating at that time. So, you know, mm, interesting that their entire office was destroyed, isn't it? You've got the IRS in there, Department of Defense as well, CIA. So this isn't just a bunch of banks that went down. This, <laughs> this was, uh, you know, the real deep state type organizations that actually had um, space and information and offices in these in this building that were destroyed. So that in itself is a bit of a red flag. But somewhere down here we've got... Uh, an explanation of where the fires were. So the NIST report provides photographic evidence of fires occurring on floors 7 to 9, 11 to 13, 19, 22, 29 and 30. The report states that fires on the four upper floors, 19, 22, 29 and 30, were of relatively short duration and inconsequential in terms of causing the collapse. The NIST report claims that the fire on the 12th floor of the northeast corner of the building was primarily responsible for initiating the collapse by causing heat-induced failures of the 13th floor structure. So they're saying that basically fires on the lower levels uh, caused the issue, and they actually say that it softened the steel and that caused the collapse in a particular point. And it goes through in graphic detail explaining the fine points of what they say happened and so on. So you can see here, this is basically NIST's claims of what happened to the building. <laughs> and it's completely ridiculous. It doesn't look anything like the actual video footage of what happened on that day. Uh, I mean, I don't even know what to say about that. But um, So yeah, it's a very interesting document. And I highly recommend anybody who wants to study this and understand the real history of America and what really happened with these wars that we've been dealing with and ISIS and everything that sprung up from it and who was involved and why they did it. I definitely recommend you checking this because it's it's very difficult to disagree with this. You have to really be highly qualified and experienced in the maths of all of this to even address it, really. Um, but you can see, you can get a good sense from this document of the major flaws in the official, so-called official government narrative. And it's, you know, even for the most diehard government fan, you know, if you're not going to deny reality, you're going to have to accept that there's major points here that need to be addressed. So I just want to leave you with this footage, which was from the day and uh, the actual day of the events. The World Trade Center 7 building was sometimes called the Salomon Brothers building. As it says here, collapsed neatly into its own footprint. As it happens, the BBC, British Broadcasting Corporation, were covering this story 
and well you'll see they <laughs> they had a reporter showing talking about the events of the day and in the background you could see the site and you could see the towers were missing and she went on to say that world trade center 7 had collapsed and they were talking about that but you could still see it behind her and at that point that that broadcast went out the tower hadn't actually collapsed and given that there really was no major damage done to it and that there really were only office fires in there and given that I mean, even the NIST report and this report from Alaska both state that such a high-rise tower steel construction had never before collapsed under, as a result purely of fires. There are many videos of massive fires raging for days sometimes in these tall structures and they don't collapse. Given that that's extremely unlikely and unusual, there wouldn't really be much reason for people to think that World Trade Center 7 would collapse other than that they just watched the other two towers collapse, uh, mainly because no plane had hit this tower. So why would you... I mean, I certainly... I remember at the time, I was watching this live, and there was <laughs> nothing in me that was thinking, oh, that building's going to collapse. There's no... You had no reason to think that. And yet she said, oh, it's collapsed, but you could still see it behind her. Now, more on the latest building collapse in New York. You might have heard a few moments ago, I was talking about the Salomon Brothers building collapsing. And indeed it has. It seems that this was not a result of a new attack. It was because the uh, building had been weakened uh, during this morning's attacks. We'll probably find out more now about that from our correspondent, Jane Stanley. Jane, what more can you tell us about the Salomon Brothers building and its collapse? Well, only really what you already know. Details are very, very sketchy. As you can see behind me, the uh, Trade Center appears to be still burning. We see these huge clouds of smoke and ash, and we know that behind that there's an empty piece of what was a very familiar New York skyline, a symbol of the financial prosperity of this city, but uh, completely disappeared now, and New York is still unable to take on board what has happened to them today. Presumably there were very few people in the Salomon building when it collapsed. I mean, th there were, I suppose, fears of possible further collapses around the area. That's what you would hope, because they don't really know where to turn. Uh, that's the very sad thing. I think there's going to be a lot of very, very traumatized people that, that has hit them very, very hard. So with that, I really hope you're going to go and uh, take a look into all of this material yourself and dig a bit deeper if you haven't already. And if you have, then please do do your best to continue helping to pass on this information to as many people as possible. I do feel that part of the issue we have here is that most people just can't bring themselves to accept that this massive crime was not actually committed by the people who at certain nations then went on to go and mass murder. Uh, in some sort of attempt at gaining revenge and that in reality these crimes were perpetuated by a conglomerate of extremely evil people within their own nation and within the governments and corporations uh, which many of us perhaps hold in high regard pay for or even work for uh, you know the, certain elements within those groups I would suggest are absolutely working in opposition to the best interest of humanity and I think it's for the best of everybody that we come to terms with that and take action of some form to change our destiny so that things like this cannot continue to occur and that our future generations and our current generations can enjoy some sense of peace and resolution to all of this. So yeah, please do like, subscribe, share as usual this material and until next time, peace.